So, uh, while well, well, we're getting Linus' uh, microphone fixed, uh, by the way, no slides. Uh, and definitely everybody get your, uh, your phone switched off or, or on silent. And maybe I'm going to have to remember to do that in a minute myself. Um, just to get an idea of the demographics here, uh, could, how many of you guys are students? Raise your hand, like hi. So, most of you. How many uh, staff members, faculty members at Alto? Okay, great. Uh, how many of you are developers in one way or the other? Excellent, all right, very good. Um, and how many of you are either currently entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, or are looking at that as a, as a possible career? Okay, good, we're getting there. A nice, uh, one other nice thing that, that I can't test uh, like this, but I noticed looking at the sign-ups that almost exactly 50% of the audience is, have, does not have a Finnish last name. So Finnish or Swedish, so I assume both of those. So we have a very multinational crowd here, and uh, I, think, I think it's going to make for a nice setup. So I, the general idea here would be, is I, I, I'm going to kick things off with a couple questions. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I want to open it up very quickly to you guys and uh, really encourage you to, to, to come up with something interesting to ask. And uh, I'm sure Linus will find, find something interesting to, to answer. I'll preempt him with one thing, by the way. It's, uh, I think he'll tell you that he's not an entrepreneur. <laughs> he's an engineer. And I think it's a really interesting, this whole, the, the whole history of Linux is, uh, is, is really interesting as it relates not only to entrepreneurial uh, stuff, but basically to getting things done and building something big with high ambition. So let me, let me start off, um, I, did a, I did a search on Google video of Linus Torvalds and I got 1.45 million hits. <laughs> So I could, and I went, went and watched a, looked a few of those to figure out what are the questions that have been asked already, and what uh, uh, might still be left to ask. And I'm sure that I uh, obviously don't hit all of it. Also, uncovered a great page with uh, Linus Torvalds quotes, which is a, a, a treasure trove of interesting stuff. Um, really recommend you guys to take a look. I'm at leaving it. now. <laughs> <laughs> some bad mistakes uh, at times and bought some odd computers that were not 
not very well supported. And as a result of that, I have gotten very used to the fact that you can't even buy ready-made programs. You have to write them yourself because uh, I started off with a Big 20, which was actually fairly common, but it was co common at the time when it was not common to really buy stuff for it. So I started programming, then I switched to a computer that was very much unsuccessful, the Sinclair QL, that had a very small community, and again, that meant that there was never even a question of running programs that other people wrote. If you didn't write your own programs, you didn't do anything with that computer. Pretty much. So I had been constantly just doing programming all my life, and I was looking for a new project, and they all ended up being things I used myself. Plus the occasional game that was so bad that I could never use it. So, but usually it was things like, I wrote my own assembler, I wrote my own editor, I wrote my own tool for doing this and that. And uh, I came to Helsinki University, found out about Unix, and decided I wanted to have Unix at home. And how hard can it be? I mean, you, you really, but you really come from that like history of saying, hey, I always write my own tools. And I mean, I actually tried to find commercial tools again. And this time it was on a regular PC, so you actually would expect that by now, in 91, you can actually finally, in my life, I wouldn't have to write my own tool because I can buy it. But it turns out I couldn't because it was expensive as hell. And uh, it was geared towards literally banks. The, if you looked at Unix on PCs back in the 90s, the main users were were banking applications and things like that. And for some reason, when you sell into that market, you don't, you add three digits at the end of the, of the number just because banks is where the money is, so it's very, so it was not geared towards my kind of use where I wanted it for my own personal use. Um, so it wasn't planned, and it was very much accidental, and it literally was a question of, hey, I've done my tools, all my life. I'll do this too. Interesting. What, what was the, uh, can you identify the first point where you, you thought that there might be some level of commercial opportunity? I can identify the first point where I said, what, they're so bad, yes. <laughs> uh, it would actually happen very early on. Uh, like I remember, I think it was Bike Magazine in like January 92 or something. I mean, this was really rough. This was Linux 0.12, and uh, there was an ad for selling. Uh, what was the first time? Was it SLS that was the first one or something? Where they basically sold a service of you could buy seven high density floppy disks, I think. And it was, I forget how much it was. And the only reason I actually know about this was, uh, I didn't get that bike myself, but Andrew Tannenbaum, who we had a few small discussions before, <laughs> he, he actually sent me the notice about this and asked me, was this really what you wanted to have? And uh, I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, because uh, by then I had realized it wasn't really about the, the price, but that what I wanted to happen was an easy availability of Unix because that was what I had looked for and couldn't find. So in a sense, it was like, I, it was clear that Andrew Tannenbaum expected me to say, no, I wanted, I wanted to be free on the internet and these people who are selling it are evil, but I was actually, hey, it's convenient to buy it if you have the 35 bucks or whatever it was. It was not a huge amount of money, but it wasn't like five bucks either. Uh, you can buy it on the floppy and not wait for seven days for it to download over a 300 baud modem. Um, how about um, early on? You know, you said you'd obviously been programming for some time, had some victories and some 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 failures. I mean, can you identify the few kind of things you would have done differently very early, or, you know, and then the converse, the mistakes that were made as, as, as you started 
let's say, building it and extending it? Really, in the very early days, I had a hard time really mentioning what I did that I could have done wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, none of my programming career was really planned. It was a passion for me. I started writing when I was so young and I read all these books about assembly language without really even noticing. I did not, so kind of a background. I did not understand that assembly language was supposed to be the symbolic form of, of, of a machine code. So I always called what I wrote assembly language, even though what I actually wrote was the literal numbers. I wrote the machine code because I, I did not have an assembler. So to me, assembly language was the data statements that had the numbers in them. That's how I started doing assembly language. And, uh, Anybody who actually knew what they were doing would have called that machine code and would have bought an assembler because they realized that's just stupid. But I didn't know what I was doing. So I literally, for several years, including my first few months with the Motorola 68K, I would do the assembly by hand and actually write machine code. So that was just because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> How, how about is, uh, is it, you know, then fast forward to the kind of Linux community starting to build. Um, in terms of management of the communi community, I mean, I think this is a, I guess Linux is known to be the biggest collaborative effort of mankind. I've read some, I think Wired called it or something well, like that. But obviously the management, how did, how did you get it going? So I actually think building the pyramids took a lot more planning than Linux. <laughs> because one of the things that I think is really interesting is uh, there was zero management, there was no logistics, there was no planning going on at any point. And what happened was through open source, people did what they were good at doing. So for example, I still don't maintain a website. I have never in my life done any web programming because I'm not interested. I think that kind of stuff is... You have MIS people to do that for you, right? I'm interested in programming. Uh, <laughs> but there are people out there who, who they set up a website and do all the DNS magic, and they can do it in their sleep because, I mean, that's what they do. And they don't even think of it as their job. It's just that's something that they do on the side. And, uh, and the fir that's what happened when, when I put Linux up for FTP for, for the first time. I never figured out how to set up an FTP site, right? There was somebody who did it for me, Sari Lemkin. There was uh, the whole, when business started happening. Um, I didn't get into this for the business side. I wanted to do, again, programming. So when other people started selling Linux, I, Linux, I was like, yes! Now I can avoid caring about that side, too. Uh, I got out of, for the very early versions, I had to do my own programs in user space just because, I mean, I was the only person there. So for the first couple of months, I would release not just my kernel sources, but I would also release two disk images. And two disk images, because the first disk image was the binary version of the kernel disk so you could write it to the boot floppy and the other disk image contained your root file system. There was no in it. There was no in it. In it is too fancy. We only need a boot shell and that's it. That's how real men do things. Right? And, and then somebody else came along and said, hey, this is stupid. You need to have in it. And I went, I do. And, and, and they just did it. And I stopped doing my disk images because again, that was not what I was interested in. So the, the real power of open source, as far as I'm concerned, well, one of them, is that different people are good at different things, and different people have different interests. And what open source really allows is that you don't even have to, you don't have to do the planning ahead of the logistics of setting up a company. And I, I realize this is a lot of entrepreneurship. And you should set up a company, and you should know that you need an MIS person, and you need an executive assistant, and you need this and that, and, and you need to know how to balance the books. And as far as I'm concerned, the big advantage of open source is 
people do what they're good at and they automatically gravitate towards that. If you're good at doing a website, you like doing that kind of things, you just do it. And, and that was very interesting how there was no planning involved because we didn't need to plan. It was all very organic. And that's actually how the development has worked too. That we have, I mean, we've had some situations, we've had the source control management issues, we've had that happen a few times where we had really painful problems with maintaining the source code and, and having to, to completely change how we did things. And then we really had to do that in a planned manner. And that, those did not happen randomly. But those are actually very few. Most of what happened in, in Linux development was very natural. The, the hierarchy we use for doing development, the fact that I work with 10 maintainers, roughly, 10 or 20 maintainers who all have their own sub-areas, and they have their sub-maintainers that they work with and they trust, and, and they have their portion of their sub-areas, and we have this network. It wasn't like we designed that either. It's just happened because that's how people work. Uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of Linux development has been very, very much an organic Process. Thanks, Tony. I guess trusting uh, two-way trust between the parties. Yes, but on the other hand, we a lot of this is stuff that I analyze later, saying, "Hey, that's how it works," and I'm wondering why does it work that way. But the fact is that is how people work. That the whole two-way trust between a small number of people. You trust your friends. You trust the people you work with for over time, and. You don't trust a hundred people. I would never trust this audience. I mean, you're, you look like a shifty couple of guys. You trust your close relatives. You trust five, ten, fifteen people. Even people who know a lot of people. Even when you have like a huge network of people you rely on. You, maybe you're on LinkedIn and you have maxed out and you had five thousand people in your network. How many of those do you trust? Ten, right? And that's kind of a basic issue that the, the way people work is, is I think, inherent it's in our brain. I mean, the, the ten might be five for some people who are not that socially adept, and it might be 50 for some that are. But, but at the same time, the whole development process actually, I think, is, is <coughs> It works really well, and I think one of the reasons it works really well is because it grew up. We didn't try to enforce a certain hierarchy on it. We used a hierarchy that just worked on its own, and that turns out to be the right hierarchy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe my, my last question, and then uh, I'll turn it open to the audience. Um, obviously, a number of companies have been commercializing uh, Linux. In, in, so my question would be, are you kind of satisfied with that end of the, the way it's been commercialized? It, it's uh, okay. It's better than okay. I mean, it's, it was something that we were nervous about in the beginning. I mean, no question that when people started, I mean, when I say we, I mean we. I mean, we, by then, it wasn't just me. It was these other engineers that had slowly started getting involved that whenever it was, I mean, Long before IBM said we'll put a billion dollars, we had the small companies, and, and people were worried that what would happen when commercial interests. And what happened was commercial interests suddenly want to sell Linux, so they want to do all the boring crap. They do, they do Q and A. They do. I mean, raise your hand if you want to do Q and A. <laughs> right? <laughs> Not a, oh, there was a hand up there. I think that's a joke. Doing the whole user interfaces and trying to make it user friendly, that was not a high priority for the technical guys, especially early on. So the, the commercial interest actually forced Linux to become much more well balanced. And that, I mean, I'm sure we've had our clashes, but at the same time, without the commercial guys, Linux would never have gotten where it was, which is kind of sad looking at so many of the open source projects, especially at the time. I think that has changed. But especially at the time, a lot of the open source projects were very much anti-commercial. And there was a very strong, uh, we need to 
keep this free and pure and companies are evil inherently and trying to sell it leads to bad problems. Uh, and uh, I think and hope that mentality is largely gone now, but it's coming to us there. Great. All right. So um, I want to open up for some questions here. So uh, first one spotted here. So you all, and we have a couple questions. Uh, hi, Gil. Still, uh, is, do you follow any uh, development of any new programming languages? Do you see any any uh, language except C, which is suitable for development of a very system? So I have to say. I'm kind of old-fashioned, and I'm really interested. I, the reason I got into the Linux and the operating systems in the first place was I really love hardware. I love tinkering with hardware. I, I, not in the sense that I'm a hardware person. I, giving me a soldering iron is a bad idea. But I, I like interacting with hardware from a software perspective. And uh, I have yet to see a language that comes even close to C in that respect. It's not just that C, you can use C to generate good code for hardware. It's that if you think like a computer, writing C actually makes sense. I mean, and, and I think the reason it works that way is the people who design C designed it at, at a time when you, I mean, when compilers had to be simple and the language had to be kind of geared towards what the output was. So when I read C, I know what the, the assembly language will look like. And that's something I care about. The, I don't do a lot of programming myself anymore. I'm a technical lead person. I merge other people's code. But if you go and look in the Linux kid history and look at what I do, the last few months, the kind of code I've changed, I made sure are. Uh, file and path lookup takes as few cache misses as possible. And uh, all that code is C, but in order to really be able to, it's optimized at the level where I worry about single instructions kind of thing, and especially single cache misses. And I love doing that because that's, it's completely, I mean, to some degree people say you should not micro optimize. But if, what? you love is micro-optimization, <laughs> that's what you should do. And we made sure our algorithms are, are, are good before we started the micro-optimization. So uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we look up path names way faster than anybody else, I guarantee you. And we can do it in parallel on a thousand CPU machine with no attention. I mean, that is something that has happened in the last 18 months, and that is impressive. You don't know how impressive it is <laughs> until you've worked that code for. I mean, I thought we'd never get there, but we're there now. So, so that's the kind of thing that really excites me from a technical standpoint. Next one back here. I was about to ask a question already this morning, but if I have a chance. The Linux operating system is standard de facto for the service mode. Successful on cell phones is not because you have 
900,000 people downloading disk images and installing them on their cell phone every day. No, it's because it comes on the cell phone reinstall. And that has never happened in the desktop market, and it's really hard to get it to happen. I mean, you, you get it to, there have been companies that sell, like Dell, even Finland, although I know they do it in the US, but I think they do it in Finland too. But especially if you're a big business and you want to run Linux, they will pre-install Linux on your desktop. But it's something where you have to specify that you want it, and they do it for a very limited portion of their of the machines they sell. Okay. So it's not something very common. And if you don't get the pre-installs, you're never going to get the desktop dominance. And uh, will that ever happen? Right now, the biggest hope is projects like Google Chromebook. And I have a first generation Chromebook, and the thing is slow and horrible. And when I get back home, uh, I think I should have a second generation Chromebook in the mail. Just because, for some odd reason, Google sends me these things. <laughs> so, so I will see, I, I know the hardware is so much better, so I'm no longer no worried about the, the slow part. Uh, but if this is something where I don't think you hit it on the, I know you don't hit it on the first generation, I don't think you hit it on the second. On the third generation, maybe on the 4th, 5th, that's when we start talking. If you look at Android, it was an Android 1.0 that took off. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful that on the desktop it will happen, but the only way it happens is if we have print installed. And it's, it's not there today. Okay, over here. And then I'll pass it. I'm the wrong person to ask for the reasons I, I mean, it's happened gradually and I don't notice the difference, right? You could probably ask somebody who's known me but not seen me day to day and say, okay, compared to the geeky kid who didn't really like to look people in the eye uh, when he was 20 years old, what is... What's the big difference? I, Between him and the guy that sat next yeah. to the president last night? <laughs> <laughs> that was so, so it was, uh, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that still makes Linux interesting for me is A, that technical challenges keep on changing. So we still do relevant technical work, I and mean, there's no question about that. But part of it is my, my work has also changed. I don't do programming anymore. I have had to make things like Git and try to make process changes so that we work scale better as a community. Uh, and these days I do, most of what I do is communication. I mean, I, what I do is I read email, I pull people's changes, or I tell people that, no, this is too ugly to live, please go away and never approach me ever again. <laughs> so, so that's kind of what I do. And, and, and that has changed over time, and that has kept the whole thing interesting for me, and I think for, I mean, there's, there's literally people involved in Linux development who I remember coming in in mm -hmm. mid-2000, 
least in late 91 and certainly early 92. So there are other peoples who have been involved in over 10 years. Not many, but. All right, get back there and then to the front row here. Uh, hello, my name is Miguel. I run an open source. Uh, Can you speak a little louder? Uh, I'm Miguel. I run uh, an open source company based in Portugal. And I'm wondering uh, about the state of budget wars uh, around companies. If you are going to do uh, Linux again, the kernel again, what license would you choose? Um, I, the one choice I'm really still very, very happy about is the license choice. Now, admittedly, the GPL version 2 is not the original license. The original license was something I wrote. It was like three lines of code, and it says, you may not charge money for it. If you make changes, you have to send them back to me. Maybe it was only two lines. <laughs> See one so, two. So, um, but I'm completely convinced that GPL version 2 is the right license. And that doesn't mean that it's a perfect license. It's, it's still legalese, and it's still there's gray areas in the license that it could have been it could have been better. But I really very deeply agree with the things laid out in the GPL version two. Even though I then very deeply disagree with most of the stuff that comes out of Richard Stallman's mouth. <laughs> so the two are not in any way, I mean, you don't have to agree with Richard Stallman to still like GPL version 2. Uh, so I would not change that, I mean, I would not change the license, that's for sure. There might be other things I would do differently, but I can't think of them either. Thank you. Thank you. So, show of hands, how many of you are involved in an open source project that is not the kernel? Okay, a fair number. How many of you have a core team that is more than 10 people? Just one, ten, maybe another tentative hand. The normal size for most open source projects are three people. Roughly, I mean, there may be people here. I mean, there were a couple of hands that had more than ten people. Maybe there would be a, some more that had more than five. In the kernel, we have fifty really, I mean, fifty people who are very, very core. Every single release, every three months, we have a thousand people involved that send us patches. There's the kernel development community, and I do not know why is the deepest development community in the open source area by far, I mean by two orders of magnitude often. And uh, if I disappeared tomorrow, there would be, I mean, there, we'd all have to raise the flag to half mass. So, and it would be really sad that nobody would even notice it. <laughs> and not quite true, but there's a lot of people, I mean. Uh, it's not that I make decisions, but definitely most of the real work is done by many people. Uh, the, there's many layers of decisions even before most code ever reaches me. And there are at least three or four of the core developers that can take over my work and do take over my work when I go on vacation occasionally. It, when I go away for a week, I don't even bother. I must just let people know that, hey, please, we're not in the merge window. Just don't bother me too much because I'll, I'll be away. But if I go away for two weeks, I tell people like Greg and David and Andrew and a couple of other people that, hey, for two weeks, you're in charge. So I have at least four people who are like, they, they can do what I do. In fact, Greg largely does do what I do. And they, if you know who Greg is, you know who Greg is. If you don't, you don't care. So I know. <laughs> okay, there's one in the middle. Uh, although you said you're like really technical person and you're interested in programming and yeah. you're not interested in some of the stuff like user interface and other stuff. But you know, 
whatever you say kind of influences quite a lot on all those films. For instance, you said you didn't really like Good Home 3 interface, and people are all going like, whoa, Linda says, you know, Good Home 3 is crap, and something like that. So how do you feel about your influence in those kind of fields that you're not interested in? So sometimes I'm a bit <coughs> upset that people take what I say a bit too seriously. <laughs> then, then five minutes later, I said, screw that. I, don't know. Right. I like that people take me seriously, but at the same time, I refuse to then let that mean that I don't say what I mean. I mean, I've always wanted to be very honest in my, in my statements. Uh, I use strong language on the internet to the point where some people feel offended, and that's their problem. I, uh, I actually think that, especially in a community like uh, open source, other developers need to know how I feel about things. I'm not, I'm impolite because I'm impolite, I mean, I'm not making excuses for that. But I also actually believe that when, when you work with a lot of people, it's better to be really open about your feelings so that you don't have people who, by mistake, misread you. Uh, I've had that happen. I, I have literally had developers who were working on things that I didn't really like, but I didn't shut down early enough. They worked on it for a long time. They felt that it was ready. They submitted it to me, uh, and I said, no, this is horrible. Because at that point, I had to make a decision. And uh, in at least one of those cases, I had some other friends basically email me later and saying the guy is suicidal. Right. I mean, I, and that's not my fault, but at the same time, I, 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 if I'm open early on and say, hey, this is going down a direction that I don't like, I think that's actually healthier for everybody involved instead of me stringing people around along and trying to be polite. So, partly it's my personality. I am blunt, and I am from Finland, and I tell people what I feel like. But partly it's actually a conscious choice to say, no, I'm not going to tone it down just because somebody might be hurt. Thank so. you. Interesting. Okay, over here. So, Git, actually, I'm proud of Git. I want to say this. Uh, it was the fact that I had to write Git was accidental. But Linux, the design came from a great mind, and that great mind was not mine. I mean, you have to give credit for the design of Linux to Cunningham, Ritchie, and, and Thompson. Uh, I mean, there's the, there's a reason I like Unix and why I wanted to redo it. I do want to say that Git is a design that is mine and unique, and I'm proud of the fact that I can damn well also do good design from scratch. Okay, yeah. nice. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what's the latest excellent thing? <laughs> <laughs> I may have to come back to that. I mean, we've had a lot of stuff that was accidental. I mean, the fact that, uh, for example, that we do fairly well in cell phones and that multi-core in cell phones is actually important now and we're really good at it, was an accidental result of the fact that we happened to do supercomputers 10 years ago. Uh, so there's those kinds of accidents that happen that are accidents because different people work on different kind of projects and it turns out that five years after the fact there were actually things that connected them that nobody ever saw coming. Right? And that's, that's been a huge success of the films. and I think that's interesting from a technical standpoint how important it has been for Linux to actually have one single kernel for every single device out there. I don't think people, and I didn't actually think it would be possible, but if you look at every single other operating system out there ever, nobody has ever done that before. Look at Apple. 
they have separate operating systems for the for their low end devices and their high end devices. We've got uh, Microsoft, same thing. They're claiming that they're uh, trying to merge them in Windows 8. They're lying. They're not. They're full of shit. <laughs> 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 We did it because I actually care about beauty, and it turns out it was nicer to do it the way Linux did it. And it's a unique thing in Linux, and it's a big strength because it turns out there's often these kinds of accidental uh, technical connections that people didn't believe in at the time, but then things changed, and, and now cell phones have the same issues that super. going and, 
and everybody's really gone home.